company specializing in municipal finance. And uh, I have with me Matt Tegdale, who's a first vice president, and Lainey Markasich, who's an associate with the firm. Uh, they're both, we all office in Salt Lake City. And just a little bit about George K. Baum, so you know it's not a real common name, but we specialize in municipal finance. And we help issuers throughout the state, throughout the country, uh, issue bonds for, for different projects. In the state of Utah, we work uh, a lot with a lot of different utility companies, cities and towns and counties, and state entities as financial advisor and as underwriter. We've had the pleasure to work with Heber Bike Power over the past 20 years, and I've been involved with war bonds and financing. Not been a lot of them, but there have been a few over the past 20 years. So we have history, and I have asked my colleagues to bring files. If we don't have answers today, I promise to you that we'll make notes of those and get back to you your answers to questions. But we hope to have questions to any answers. Now, we have prepared a couple different things today. We have prepared a Bond 101 discussion, which would be more of a 10,000-foot discussion about municipal finance and markets. Uh, or we have a discussion that's more specific about the power company's bonds, the past history of refundings and financings, and can answer more specific questions about those. So I'm happy to discuss uh, either one of those in your direction, whatever you choose, whatever you find would be more helpful. I have a question on page 15 of the 2012 bond agreement. Why is it that our bond payments are essentially doubling in the year 2025 to the year 2035? Uh, can you tell me what bond agreement you're talking about? It's the 2012 bond agreement saying series 2012 bonds outstanding parity bonds, and the principal and payment is 348000 in 2012. This year it's 354000 It goes that way in the 300 range up to 2024. And then in 2025, it, it automatically increases to 624000 and it stays in the 600000 yeah. for that last 10 years. Why is that? That's a great question. And let me I think that question goes along to the more specific financing for the district here. So the company, look, should we go through that and mm -hmm. then we can answer a more yeah, broad one-on-one? On one. Is that okay with you? Well, so there's no easy answer? To there is me? an easy answer, and what I'm passing out will show that to you very, very simply. The, uh, and if I could just walk through two or three pages, I'll get directly to that answer, if that would be okay with you. Is it Heidi? Yes, I'm Heidi. Would that be all right, Heidi? Okay. So uh, what I've handed out, and I apologize for everyone else, but I will try to, can we get it up on the screen? That'd be great. I think that'd be helpful for everyone. What I've handed out is a presentation that we're going to get up on the screen, and I'll refer to this presentation. Uh, the first page, if you turn to this page, it says outstanding debt. This illustrates the company's currently outstanding debt. Uh, there are three bond issues, the 2010 A's, the 2010 B's, and the 2012 bonds. That represents all of your long-term municipal bonds are outstanding. The 2010A bond was issued in 2010, and that was a refunding of a CAT financial lease. So the company did a financing with CAT financial for some generators, and that lease was outstanding at an interest rate of 4.75%. That paid off in 2015. And uh, the 2010A bonds refunded that cat lease and extended those payments, and we'll talk about the extension in a minute. Remember, the old bond, the old lease was out of 4.75. The refunding bonds went to 4.25, so there was a decrease. The original bond of the 2010A, if you go to the next page, this is what we're talking about, was 1.6575 million. It's currently outstanding, and 1.295 million. The final maturity is in 2023, and this call date, which we will talk about in a minute, is in 2020. So the bonds that are callable after the call date is 760000 
in 2010, there was a new money issue that was issued under the American Reinvestment Recovery Act. It's called the, uh, well, the ARRA. Many of you, uh, I don't know if in your individual cities, if you did any financings or received any money associated with the Stimulus Act called the American Reinvestment Recovery Act. But part of that act, what the federal government did is they encouraged projects that were shovel ready, ready to go, and the Treasury Department would provide a 35% interest rate subsidy for those bonds that were issued under this Build America Bond Improvement, or the American Reinvestment Act. These bonds, the 2010 B bonds, which were issued at the same time as the 2010A, again, this was a refunding, and this was new money. It had uh, insurance, there was insurance purchased from AGM, and let me explain this for a minute, because this is important, the ratings. Ratings and bond insurance is a credit enhancement. You can sell bonds in several different ways. You can sell them as non-rated, you can sell them with some sort of credit enhancement, and credit enhancement can be obtained from bond rating companies like Moody's and Standard and & Poor's and Fitch. Those are the three main bond rating companies. You pay them a fee, they look at your documentation, and they stamp it and said, we think your rating is whatever. Then we take that rating, put it on the offering document, and investors will look at that and say, do I want to buy this bond based on this rating? Or do I want to pass on that? That rating is helpful to lower your interest rate. The whole purpose of a rating is to lower your interest rate. It's a market-driven thing. Uh, the bond insurance is also credit enhancement. Back before 2008 and before, there were 10 bond insurers, a rock of bond insurance, that you could buy very cheap. And when you bought that bond insurance, you would basically receive their AAA rating. And so then you could sell your bonds with the AAA rating, which would then lower your cost. So ratings is all about economics. We're trying to reduce the cost of the borrowing, and that's the strategy for ratings. So here we bought bond insurance from this bond insurance company. As a result, we received this AA3, because that was the rating of the bond insurance company. The underlying rating from Moody's which is, we had two ratings, Moody's and Fitch, was A2. So we bought the bond insurance at AA3, Moody's rated individually the company at A2. Fitch rated the company at a AA minus. So there's a split rating between Moody's and Fitch. They view it differently, they have different criteria, they view things a little differently, yes? And how much did it cost to buy the bond insurance to get that upgraded rating? Have it right there. Because I'm sure there's separate bond insurances for each of these series. There is. Uh, these were considered one, the 2010 A and B. $54,000. So $54,000, and this is a pure economic analysis. To spend $54,000, do we reduce our interest costs more than it costs us to buy the bond insurance? If it doesn't, then why would we buy, buy bond insurance? But it did, and so we bought bond insurance. Our savings were much greater than 54000 That's an economic analysis. Here, this bond, 2010B, and if I'm talking too loud, I'll tone it down, but I want to make sure that you hear uh, 2010B was sold at the same time. They were virtually the same official statement, which is the disclosure document. One was just labeled 2010A with the amortizations. One was 2010B. The B bonds were the ones that are subject to this treasury subsidy. This is very important to recognize this treasury subsidy. Uh, it's 35% of the total interest that you pay on those bonds is received from the U.S. Treasury Department. And that's what this BAB, that's why it said BAB, Build America Bonds. Again, that was part of the American Reinvestment Recovery Act. So these bonds are rated the same because this was basically considered one bond but here's the amortization. It was 4.85 million sold. The amortization went out to 2035, longer than this one. And currently, after 2020, there's still 4.85 million outstanding. So you can see that this is deferred around this one because there's still the same amount after 2020 that's still there. And I'm going to show in a graph how these look as far as the total debt stacked up. 
You're saying we're not paying on that one until the first one's paid. I'm saying that, yeah, and we'll get to it exactly. Heidi? I am just amazed that we're deferring $4.8 million of debt until when, 2020? Well, let me... Is that why the bonds are going to double in 2025? No. And let me, let me, I, I need to provide some more information. Okay. How long does that 35% subsidy last? Is it for the lifetime of this bond until 2035? That's correct. Okay, that, one more question. I'm not trying to be mean here. No. Did you receive separate commissions for the 2010, 2010A and 2010B, or did you receive one commission for each of those bonds? One commission. And what was the total, please? What was it? Uh, total was uh, thirty-nine thousand one hundred fifty dollars. How much did uh, a AGM receive? That's the fifty-four thousand. That's the fifty-four thousand. Okay. One more question. Let me think. Um, do you recommend? Because as I understand it from the bond agreement. I think a million or so of one of those 2010 bonds was put into our treasury fund to earn interest for the future. Do you recommend, given the way interest rates are, given the way you know pension state retirement systems have borrowed pension bonds and then haven't been able to earn the interest to pay back even the bond? I mean, do you did you recommend that at this time in 2010A for bond proceeds to be put into the bank and earn interest off of that? No. Uh, that would never be. First of all, uh, you're right. That doesn't work on several different fronts. One, it doesn't work in this in in interest rate environment. But most importantly, that would be illegal to have money set aside for years and years and years from a tax and bond proceeds. So there's a reasonableness test. When you issue bonds, the IRS says that you need to plan to expend that money within three years. If you don't plan to, issue, to spend that money within three years, then at the three year mark, you have to actively manage that cash so it doesn't earn more than the bond cost. Okay, so if your yield was 4% and you get to three years and the projects have been delayed and you haven't spent that money, then you need to actively say, okay, we cannot earn over 4% because that's the bond yield cost, and we have to actively manage to keep it below 4%. And we all know, I'd love to have 4% in this environment on yeah. the reinvestment. That's not the case, so it's not <coughs> an issue. But in the past, that would have been an issue. And how do you manage, how do you suppress an interest rate reinvestment? Well, there are different state and local government securities that have 0% interest or 1%. It's designed to do exactly that. They're called state and local government securities and they're part of the U.S. Treasury security program. So is it, we would never have uh, suggested, and I don't think that was, uh, if you're telling me different, then this is news to me, but the original, if there was money outstanding beyond the three years, the money was spent or were planned for projects. So if it wasn't spent from this money, because this money, was already spent. This was a refund, so this wasn't money. But this, this had new money to it, and if there was new money still outstanding, then the projects must not have uh, gone as quickly as planned. The reason I'm asking is because I've only read that in the bond agreement that some money was put aside into the Utah State Treasury Fund, and I don't know the status of that right now. Okay, where? Let's get the answer to that because I'm not sure. What what figure are you? I'll have to look it up again on the bond agreement. agreement. Because we did have the escrow to pay off the cap. This was 1.8 oh, million. Right. It was 1.8 million dollars. The escrow? The escrow for to pay off the cap, please. But I think that was paid off the same day. Yes, so or it, it may have been. It wasn't outstanding very long. Right. So, so that may have been what the deposit was. Well, let but me explain that. Sure any other when you do a, a refunding, uh, sometimes, the outstanding financial instrument, in this case a cap lease financing, cannot be paid and canceled immediately. Maybe there's a call notice that you have to give the finance from the bank. In this particular case, these bonds have these normal calls. And in this case, we'll find out, Matt, if you can find out, if this was not paid off immediately, it, then it would have set, been set aside in an escrow. All and, the, and the escrow. It was uh, 
Yeah. Well, we can get that. We'll find yeah, that. It, it was paid off immediately. Was, the was one million may have been construction well, funds. Okay. Because there was four point four million dollars that was generated as part of the bond to pay for projects, mm -hmm. and I wonder if maybe if, if once we deliver the proceeds, we don't necessarily follow. Right. Well, hey, you know, that's 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 the, the job trustee's job to put it aside in the bank when the interest rates were so low. Yeah, I, I, I don't think it was ever a plan no, to. It was, it was a it, that would be that's called positive trying to get positive arbitrage. That would be a silly plan, not only illegal, like I've explained, but economically a bad concerned decision. I was very about that. Yeah, and I, so I, Heidi, I don't think, from my perspective, unless something's happened in the uh, since then, that there was money planned to arbitrage based on unspent proceeds. The, the the whole idea here, and this is part of the bond attorney's responsibility. And the company certifies that they plan the reasonableness test is to spend bond proceeds within that best guess of three years. It's a reasonableness test. Three years is a long time, a lot of things can happen, and that's why just in case it doesn't happen, there's a fallback on what you do. So these are these bonds, and in 2012, and in addition to these two outstanding in 2010, there was a 2002 bond that was a refunding bond that was outstanding. We were going to refund this bond in 2010 with these two bonds, but interest rates moved against us a little bit, and it wasn't as effective to refund this 2002 bond, so we waited. Interest rates got better in 2012, and this bond was refunded in 2012, again with the same setup. We talked about the ratings. Uh, Fitch gave us the AA minus. We had the AA2 from Moody's and the AMG AA3. That was an insured rating. And you can see what's happened here. 3.7 million was originally issued. Outstanding par right now is 3.3 million. The final maturity is in 2025. The call date is in 2022. So there's only 780 bonds that exist between the final maturity date and the call date in 2022. And this call date is important, and I'm going to get to that in a little bit. Let's go to the next.